today's talk is about quantum numbers and their significance. Uh, there are four possible quantum numbers, and um, they're called the principal, the azimuthal, the magnetic, and the spin quantum number. Each electron in an atom has one of these numbers to represent it. So if the principal quantum number n is equal to 1, the possible values for L are 0, because L is always n minus 1, up to n minus 1. The magnetic is plus or minus L, so it still remains 0. The magnetic spin can be, uh, for the spin pairing of the electrons, is plus 1 half or negative 1 half. So you can generate two possible combinations, and that's why S orbitals have a maximum of two electrons. If the principal quantum number is 2, the value of L, the azimuthal, can be 1 or 0. 1 corresponds to a p orbital, uh, 0, we've already explained, is, is, is an s orbital. So if, when the principal quantum number is 2, you can have either s or s or p orbitals. When you have p orbitals, the value of the magnetic can be negative 1, 0, or 1, corresponding to the px, the py, and the pz orbital. And again, each orbital can contain up to two electrons that are spin paired, plus or minus one half. So a total, uh, if the principal quantum number is two, you can have an s or a p orbital for a total of eight electrons being held by that um, quantum number. If the principal quantum number is three, the value of the azimuthal can be two, one, or zero. Two is corresponds to d orbitals. The magnetic um, can be uh, again the value. Of magnetic is plus or minus L, so M sub L can be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, or 2. That gives rise, rise to five different orbitals, each of which can contain the two electrons that are spin paired, and that gives us the D orbitals. So if the principal quantum number is 3, you can have S orbitals, P orbitals, and D orbitals for a total of 18 electrons being held at the principal quantum number 3. Lastly, if the principal quantum number is 4, you can have F, D, P, or S orbitals, depending on the value of L. And if M sub L is um, plus or minus L, then we see that it gives you seven different possibilities, each with two electrons. That gives us 14 electrons in the F orbitals. So the, uh, if the principal quantum number is 4, you can have up to 32 electrons in that level. Notice that each and every electron is defined by four quantum numbers which describe the size, shape, orientation, and spin of the orbitals. So N describes the size, the azimuthal L describes the shape of the orbital, the magnetic describes the orientation, and the spin is for the spin pairing of the electrons within one orbital. Thus, for example, the two 1s electrons would have the following quantum numbers, 1, 0, 0, plus 1 half, and 1, 0, 0, negative 1 half the 2p electrons would have the following possible numbers. Notice how L is always 1, because that's um, the p orbitals have to have the value of L equal to 1. The principal quantum number is 2, and then when L is 1, you can have minus 1, 0, or plus 1, and then we've worked out every permutation. So there's six permutations under those conditions, and it gives rise to the px, py, and p orbitals. This is the filling order, which I've described before. This is the mnemonic I always use to help you remember how the filling order works. Numbers 1 through 8, 2 through 7, uh, 2 through, uh, through 7, 3 through 6, and 4 through 5. S, P, D, F, and you draw arrows going from the bottom of each column to the top of the next one. That's the filling order of the shells, with few exceptions. Which brings us to the next section. The next section we're going to talk about is uh, valence shell electron pair repulsions. Vesper for short. And the premise of Vesper theory is that electrons don't like to be in the same neighborhood. So if you have two electrons attached to a spherical surface in a bond situation, then those two electrons will be at opposite, the opposite ends, will be a 180 degree angle between them. If there are three, the maximum angle will be 120. If there are four things attached to a spherical surface, the angle will be 109.5. That's as far apart as you can get on a spherical surface with a 109.5 degree angle. And the electrons do that by hybridizing. For example, if you took the, the electron
electron configuration of carbon, as predicted by the electron shell filling mnemonic here, you'll get that carbon within six electrons is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So the s orbital is filled, and then there are two unpaired electrons in the p orbitals. But what happens in reality when a carbon forms a bond, and here I've represented the, uh, the ground state carbon as, it, as it's shown here, but what actually happens when carbon forms a bond is that the two electrons here combine with the uh, two electrons here to form, rather the, the, the orbitals are reformed so that S and P mix together to form four orbitals at the same energy level. And all four of these electrons will, will go into these same energy levels, and not, which is a manifestation of Hund's rule, and they'll all be non-spin paired. So uh, instead of having a filled 2s orbital and two half-filled p orbitals, what you get is four half-filled sp3 orbitals. So you get an, a hybrid orbital, uh, and they're all four equal in energy. I show this here diagrammatically. Um, take an s orbital and three p orbitals, combine them, this is called hybridization, and it forms a hybrid orbital where each of the lobes is 109.5 degrees apart. The best way to draw an sp3 hybridized carbon atom is to draw a cube, put the carbon atom at the center of the cube, and then the, the bonds will point at opposite diagonals. So it's the two diagonals at the top, and the two opposite diagonals at the bottom. And if you measure the angle between any two lobes, it's 109.5 in sp3 hybridized carbon. And the reason they call it sp3 is because if you take one s orbital and three p orbitals to form these hybrid orbitals. Other forms of hybridization are possible. For example, when you take one s orbital and two p orbitals instead of three, uh, they, more, they merge to form three sp2 hybrid orbitals, where the angles between them are 120. That leaves one of the orbitals unhybridized. And that p orbital is still capable of bonding. So you see sp2 hybridization whenever carbon is double bonded. You see an example of sp2 hybridized carbon in uh, ethylene, where you see the sigma bonds, these shaded orbitals are the sp2 hybrids. And the uh, unhybridized PZ orbital in both carbon atoms is still pointing up and down, and they have overlap sideways. That sideways overlap creates what's called a pi bond. So two of these overlaps equals one bond. So this molecule has a sigma bond and a pi bond. If you hybridize one S orbital with one P orbital, you get SP hybridized carbon. And the sp hybridized carbon is going to leave two orbitals unhybridized, pz and px. These two also overlap sideways, and you get that in a triple bond. The acetylene has that kind of hybridization. In uh, further hybridization possibilities, you get sp3d2 which creates six equivalent orbitals by hybridizing all three of these types of orbitals. And you see that kind of a geometry in uh, sulfur hexafluoride where all the bond angles are 90 degrees. You have six things stuck on a central atom and all the angles are, are 90 degrees because the orbitals 